show here. Barton Jennings, PhD, is a professor emeritus of supply chain management in the College of Business and Technology at Western Illinois University. He was hired to create the Modern Supply Chain Management Degree Program at Western Illinois in 2004, and he retired in 2019. Prior to his appointment, he worked at the Center for Transportation Research at the University of Tennessee, and prior to that, in various operational and engineering positions in the railroad industry. He teaches workshops all over, has handled training for more than 400 railroad companies, private railroads, and rail transit systems. He has, I could go on and on about the accomplishments of this gentleman right here. But tonight he is here to tell you about his book, History Through the Miles, The Railroads of U.S. Sugar. And it is part of a series of books that he has written called History Through the Miles on railroads all over the country, too numerous to mention. But we're so glad you chose to write one about U.S. sugar. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Barton. Thank you all much. Everybody hear me, right? I'm used to screaming at students who are falling asleep. I do have rubber bands here. I can shoot you if you fall asleep. I don't have any chalk dust erasers or anything here, but I will figure out a way. I do want to thank a couple of people. First, my wife, Sarah, is in the back. Most most of you know Sarah. If you don't, that's my other half. That is my editor, also the publisher. Uh, also want to talk, I uh, really thank Scott Ogle down here. Scott is in charge of the Sugar Express. And whether you all are know it or not, those of you uh, who are coming in to ride, you'll hear stories. Those of you who are local, U.S. Sugar really wants to work uh, with the community. Just an example. We've got 100 people from around the world coming in for this. We've got people from Europe coming all the way over here because of Scott. Scott has worked with us for over a year on getting this planned. He's worked the way through upper management sugar. This is new to them. This is amazing to them what we're doing for the next three days. So I want to thank you all. Uh, one other way you can help the museum, they do have copies of the book. I'll happily sign them. Uh, don't steal this one. This is an author proof and it's got more mistakes in it and know what to do with. The ones out there are correct. So what I'm going to do, this is a two-part presentation tonight. I'm going to give you information about U.S. sugar. I'm going to talk about the railroads, kind of the history of what went into this. Then we're going to take a ride across the railroad with about 100 photos. Uh, so that's kind of what we're going to do tonight. I hope all the technology works. It does. Um, this is their new slogan. I love this. Um, I raise a hell of a lot of cane. And then, pardon me, I do cuss a lot. So it's, there we go. Okay. I get asked all the time why I was even qualified. I don't live here. I currently live in Arkansas. I live up in the mountains. It's a little flat here for me, but still, uh, I do a lot of training, as I mentioned. I do a lot of research. I've worked in supply chain and transportation. I've been uh, actually uh, training employees of U.S. Sugar for over 20 years in the rail industry. Uh, operate a lot of rare mileage trips. Uh, all those hands you saw come up, they've ridden with me all around the world in weird places. Nothing like parking 150 cars in a scrap yard to go ride a train and then hope they're all there. Uh, I'm history of, I've written a lot of histories of uh, railroads, canals, transportation systems, and Lou Holtz, everybody know Lou Holtz? He and I used to rotate talking at conferences. He knew my jokes, I knew his. And so you may hear some of both. But again, the results of uh, about 10 years of research resulted in this book, which has helped, I think, uh, Sugar Express with information and has uh, really attracted a lot of people here. Okay, I wanna cover three things. I wanna go through the history of US Sugar. It's a fascinating little history going to go about the railroading and sugar here, and then we're going to talk about the major lines of U.S. sugar, because it confuses the daylights out of a lot of people. Uh, in the 1800s, there was a lot of sugar production in Florida, but it was all small farms, personal use. There's still, in fact, a few parks here in the state of the old sugar mills from the 1800s. 
World War I, they started some interest because there were some shortages. In fact, cheer wine came about because of shortages of sugar. Anybody know what cheer wine is? I got a bunch. Uh, 1920 saw a boom in investment. Uh, it was actually going to be normal vegetables down here, onions and tomatoes and things like that. But uh, what happened was the US government started investing in developing sugar that would grow here. The sugar that grew in Hawaii and Louisiana would not grow here. The dirt's different. World War II, a big interest because suddenly the sugar boats were being sunk. Uh, and then Castro and Cuba really did it. A lot of the sugar producers from Cuba moved to Florida and invested. And then some consolidation over the last 30 or 40 years. Now, the history of sugar starts with Dahlberg. Uh, Bro Dahlberg, uh, Dahlberg, I'm sorry. Uh, somehow it's got to be related to my wife. But he got involved with Florida, not because he wanted sugar. He wanted sugar cane because he made particle board out of sugar cane, out of bagasse. He originally bought 47,000 acres, became about 160,000 acres. So why him? Born in Sweden. He studied mechanical engineering uh, and really got into things. Never got a degree though. He, he learned it the hard way. Uh, he started at age 13 operating elevators and that was in the old days with ropes. He had to pull an elevator up, elevator down, became a rate clerk for Northern Pacific Railroad. Founded Celotex Corporation, uh, making wallboard out of Louisiana sugarcane bagasse. Didn't have enough there. They had major disease going through Louisiana. He saw the U.S. government was developing sugarcane for Florida. So he came, so he said, let's come down here where nobody's growing sugarcane. He started Southern Sugar, chartered it in 25. Uh, the mill opened in January of 1929, a little late. By the way, the mill was made out of parts from other mills that had collapsed or closed. Uh, it was considered the most modern facility. And the neat part was he believed in machinery. That was his mechanical training. Uh, he bought crawler tractors, cane wagons, cultivators, and four steam locomotives. And this was a report, I love this quote, most of the work on the Southern Sugar Company plantations is done by efficient machines. No horses or mules are used. All the other sugar producers at the time used horses and mules to drag the cane out of the fields. He started using tractors and locomotives. But there were a lot of problems. Uh, those of you that live down here know that occasionally you have some storms. 1926, as they were planting, they had a hurricane and flooding. And then the massive 1928 hurricane, which killed a lot of people in this area. Uh, 29, no one was here. The mill opened, but there weren't workers. Uh, it went into receivership in 1930. And then in 1931, United States Sugar Corporation was formed to buy uh, Southern. And there's an interesting reason. The investors, many of them were from General Motors. They didn't like losing their money. So they said, we're taking over the company and we're going to run it like a major corporation. And they brought in more machinery. They brought in Charles Mott, who was really their problem solver. And within a year, they were 95% of uh, Florida's sugar production. Uh, continued to modernize, bought new equipment, a lot more machinery. They increased production and the, and the operation was profitable by 1941. They started getting closer and closer to profit even during the Great Depression. Uh, this was the mill at the time, certainly looks nothing like today's mill. I'll have some pictures of the today's mill a little bit later, but uh, these were a couple of photos from an investigation uh, during the 30s and 40s. The U.S. government was interested in protecting our agricultural assets and did a major study on U.S. sugar. Much of it now available for Library of Congress. Thank goodness I keep putting stuff out for me. So who was Charles Mott? Uh, his dad owned Mott Beverage Company up in the Northeast. Uh, he got a mechanical engineering. He studied fermentation. And the family created Weston Mott uh, Company, which is an automobile supplier for basically all the automobile companies at the time. But General Motors acquired them. By 1930, 1913, owned all the Mott uh, operations, but they owned enough stock that Mott was a, on the board of directors of General Motors from 1913 to 1973, the longest member of their board. He, was also, he also headed up a number of divisions. He was known as their problem solver. 
and he came down here to solve their problems. Uh, he protected investments, created new products. He was also mayor of Flint, Michigan. I don't know if he was involved with the water system or not, but he was. <laughs> he also created the Charles Mott Foundation and also the Children's Health Center there in Flint. So he created a museum. Uh, the foundation still gives scholarships and all. Uh, it's really important uh, about them. I'll explain why here in a moment. U.S. Sugar grinds somewhere around 42,000. That number keeps going up. That was the number from a year or so ago. They produce about 800,000 tons of refined sugar, 75% of which is used for food production, cake mixes, and things like that. Somewhere around 12,500 workers, uh, over $3 billion of local impact here in Clewiston. Um, and also the biggest corn producer, sweet corn producer here in Florida, about 175,000 years, and that is going to grow as they are mixed using more and more of the land. They also own Southern Garden Citrus and a few other uh, areas. U.S. Sugar is owned by four basic groups. It's owned by the Mott Foundation, by the Mott's Children Hospital, by the Pension Fund, and by employees. Oops, go the wrong way. Now let's talk about the railroads, because that's what a lot of you are interested in. Uh, basically, Florida East Coast was to the east, Atlantic coastline was to the west. Uh, the Moorhaven and Clewiston Railway was between Moorhaven and Clewiston. They named that one right. It was actually started by developers who started both Moorhaven and Clewiston. And then there are a lot of private lines out there that confuse everybody, but that's the actual sugar cane rail operations. Um, here comes the thing. Sugar is hauled, both private lines, Florida East Coast and the ACL Atlantic coastline moved the cane on their lines while sugar moved it on their lines. A lot of this was due to old Interstate Commerce Commission regulations, which made it a pain. And here it goes, I wanna read this. Uh, United States Sugar Corporation uses its own railroad equipment to bring loaded cars from several loading points on its private tracks, about 12 miles east and south at Canal Point to the interchange track at that station. Florida East Coast then consolidated the cane cars in the trains averaging 52 to 53 cars and hauled them to Lake uh, Harbor. There, the ACL moved the cars to Clewiston, where U.S. Sugar had about 12 miles of its own track to support the mill. So to move cane about 30 to 40 miles, it took four separate trains, four separate crews, four separate locomotives. This was what the law, U.S. law said, don't get me going, I can do a full lecture on how screwed up our transportation system was and still is. <laughs> and so, going on here, this lasted basically October through uh, April every year. The ACL had five trains that they had to run a day to haul sugarcane. Florida East Coast did three. ACL was based here in Clewiston, the Florida East Coast in Belle Glade. And the percentage of sugarcane that they moved determined how much sugar they would get Generally, Florida East Coast, about 65% of the sugar that they moved to Jacksonville. ACL moved about 35% and then got it because most of it went to went Fort Wentworth, Georgia. This it irritated U.S. sugar continuously. They built a mill at Bryant so they wouldn't have to move a lot of the cane across the two railroads. They built more track into their own cane fields. They operated more trains and they filed more complaints with the Interstate Commerce Commission. Kept begging to be allowed to run their own trains. Okay, everybody's interested in the steam locomotives, right? That's the fun part. Um, U.S. Sugar has used steam from the first. By the way, the 148 out there is one of their old steam locomotives that they acquired. The problem is it's nothing but a conveyor belt to, the, to U.S. Sugar. Till recently, nobody really thought much of the history of the steam locomotives here. They were a conveyor belt, they were a tool Probably you go to U.S. Sugar, they can't tell you what pump they were using 50 years ago. Same thing about this. Uh, the records aren't clear. They were just another machine. We're not, we don't even have good records of every single steam locomotive. I found some that U.S. Sugar didn't know they owned. Uh, and there are probably more out there, but at least three of them still exist. One of which will be running and pulling us tomorrow. These are the basics. If you want all the details, they're in the book, right? You want to start saying that's all in the book. 
Most of them came from the Florida East Coast, bought secondhand. A couple of them, uh, the Durham and Southern, the 107 is a neat one. It's actually the 105, but they renumbered it for tax reasons and they also changed the boiler on it. Uh, a couple of these others uh, were not that successful. Some of them, you read the records and it says they bought it and immediately sold it. Yet I found pictures of it operating two or three years later. So uh, it's kind of an interesting issue. I put on the very bottom Atlantic Coastline 1504 that was never owned by U.S. Sugar until a year or so ago when they bought it. And so you will soon have a second steam locomotive operating here in Clewiston. Uh, 107, this is uh, the interesting locomotive that supposedly U.S. Sugar bought and then decided they didn't want. Two years later, here's a photo of it running, hauling uh, cane on the railroad. Uh, these are some of the Florida East Coast. These are passenger engines, high-speed passenger engines pulling sugar cane out in the fields. And there you have a high-speed uh, former Florida East Coast locomotive that'll be pulling us slow, slow, slow. No, we'll go 40 tomorrow. We'll, you're going you're gonna to let us hit 40 for a couple of minutes, so we will get some decent speed tomorrow. Um, now, U.S. Sugar has got two major operations. First is South Central Florida Express. That is their common carrier what the FRA, Federal Railroad Administration, calls part of the general railroad system of transportation. That's the more regulated side. That's a railroad. Then they have their private lines, which are out in the sugarcane fields, very different regulations, very different operating requirements, because it is a not part of the general railroad system of transportation. Train operations. I get a lot of questions. What's going to be running? Normally, all year long, you have a Sebring turn Monday through Friday. Uh, that calls freight up to CSX for interchange. It naturally goes to Sebring. These are not complicated names, but if, if they confuse you, let me know. Uh, Fort Pierce turn also normally runs Monday through Friday. Uh, it goes to Fort Pierce over the Florida East Coast uh, route. And then they have a local, Clewiston Bryan Air. They actually serve two to three dozen other customers including two competing uh, sugar mills, a bunch of fertilizer companies. They were moving rock today for the Corps of Engineers. Uh, so they have a number of other customers and that's why those are the part of General Railroad System Transportation. Then there are other trains. Gary Season obviously operating the cane trains, a lot of sugar cane trains day and night. That cane when it's cut has got to get to the mill. It cannot sit around. Every bit of cane, by the way, that comes to the mill does come by rail. So they have loaders just a mile or two away from the mill where they're loading. They also have a lot of contractors that sell them cane and they truck it to a loader. And so uh, those cane trains are continuously running out there. The Bryant turns, these used to run on the Florida East Coast route. They are now running on what's called the Clewiston Main, which is the brand new railroad they just opened. There's work trains out there. And then of course, the Sugar Express. And that's kind of the priority they get in right there, by the way. This is the railroad. Let me, I'm going to have to step aside from the mic. Let me kind of explain it. There are very few good maps of this. This is the old Atlantic coastline. On this side, this is the line up to Seabury. Over here is the line up to Fort Pierce. That's the Fort Pierce line. All this other stuff you see around, that's sugar lines, except for this one little line, that's the Oklahoma line. This is what they've just built, this whole section, because you had these lines up here, the Boy line, the Freeland line, basically the Bryant operation. And then you had the weather lines here and the flag hole lines here. And what they did is by building this section, everything is now connected. Those cane trains have a lot more flexibility in where they can go. And I saw a car, I saw a train this afternoon with 75 cane cars headed up for more cane. So these are some pretty big trains. They are running. And then this all is like those jokes. So kind of give you an idea of the railroad. Uh, again, the Sebring is uh, Sebring to Clewiston. It's former Atlantic coastline. It's interchanged with CSX. And it has a lot of sugarcane loading facilities on it. So uh, those of you who are riding with us Saturday, you'll see a lot of them. Uh, it was built mainly by the ACL plus the Moorhaven and Clewiston. Uh, ACL acquired the uh, Moorhaven and Clewiston in 25. It all became Seaboard Coast Line 
in 67, became Seaboard System 83. All of it went to a company called CSX in 1986. 1990, it was sold to the Brandywine Valley Railroad who created South Central Florida Express. Sugar bought it in 94 because it was their railroad. It was what served them. This is, this is neat. Remember I said, I can get, in, get some neat pictures these days if you're really digging the archives. This is how they built the railroads. They bring a crane in, it would dig ditches on either side and pile the dirt in the middle. That became the railroad grade. They try to put tracks on it, but then to dry it out, they put a lot of sand. They shovel the sand off of flat cars like this. Um, and uh, then they would jack the track up and they just kept putting the sand in there to dry it and try to stabilize it. Does that explain more why your track problems you have out there? Uh, I like this. I love the gentleman in the white suit riding the flat car inspecting the track. And this is what the uh, people building the track lived in. They literally drug these shacks along the track as they went and built the track. Uh, this is just out here at uh, Highway 720, where that was uh, photographed. Okay, Fort Pierce, Fort Pierce to Clewiston. It's Florida East Coast it's from Fort Pierce to Lake Harbor. ACL then from Lake Harbor to Clewiston. Uh, it's the interchange route to Florida East Coast. Then again, it serves a lot of facilities. Uh, it was basically all built in 29. Florida East Coast was coming down trying to get U.S. sugar. Atlanta Coastline built and met them at Lake Harbor. Uh, and uh, it's kind of become a uh, historically a junction out there. Now people just go right through it. The entertaining part was the Florida East Coast was the K line. It was a long, long line that came in from the very north part of Florida. In 47, they built a shortcut because of all the sugar business. Comes out of Fort Pierce. U.S. Sugar in 98 got rights to run up to Fort Pierce with their own trains. And then it was decided that, uh, or, um, decided that they would start actually providing service. And so they switch all the customers. I'll show you here in a moment why they don't go past 15.5 uh, serving customers. There's a lot of business those last few miles. Um, there's also the Oklahoma lead, Keelan, Oklahoma. It's former ACL, serves the Oklahoma sugar mill. It did serve other facilities briefly. It's known as the Cane Block, built in 1949. Plan, actually, the original plan was to go all the way to Miami. Never got there. Uh, the other business didn't develop. Again, became part of uh, the South uh, Central Florida Express in 90. Sugar bought it in 94. Then there's this new Clewiston main line, uh, Clewiston Yard through Bryant to the track. It is 60.6 miles long. That is an industrial sugarcane line, which is 40 mile an hour. Includes most of the sugar's private lines, a lot of cane loaders. When you have weather one, weather two, weather three, weather four, et cetera, et cetera, boy one, boy two. And there's three leads, the Bowles, the Prewitt, and the Martinez. These are basically branches off of it that go to serve more cane loaders. Most of this, by the way, I should mention is invisible. It's way out in the cane fields. It's a little visible now with all the cane cut, but you can't get the most of it. Uh, the West End near Clewiston is what they call the town site. That was some of the original line. So it's town site one, town site two are the loaders. The North End is the original canal point lines. Remember that discussion about where they were hauling their original sugar. The middle was built or opened in 2021 pretty remarkable that they are still building track. The flag hole line goes west out of here. It's 14.1 miles long. It serves a number of facilities. Some of them, again, are not U.S. sugar. Some of them are private. Other sugar companies are at least growers who are selling sugar cane to uh, U.S. sugar. You've also got the citrus lead out there. Again, it started with the town site lines, but the West End was built in 2013. That's a lot of new construction over the last decade. Uh, the yards, Clewiston Yard, the mill tracks, it's really the base of operations. Every car eventually gets there. And I should mention, you never turn a car. They only unload one way. And so every car is aligned properly for its route and its loader. Uh, there's 17 miles of track in that mill and in the yard. 
It's also the south shop. That's where most locomotive work and freight car work is being done. Although yesterday they did change out a prime mover up here at North Shop. Uh, that's where the steam engine is. Uh, that's where your cane unloading is, your sugar loading, it's milling, boiler house, refinery, packaging, power plant, everything else. And the neat part is that is mile pole zero for all the sugar lines at officially USSC Railroad Clewiston Depot. Okay, now some photos. If Sarah can make the quick swap back there, we'll see how quick this goes. Sorry about that. I hate technology. I'll bring my old slides next trip. Yeah. Okay, uh, going to follow the railroad from Sebring over to Fort Pierce and then the branches. This is the uh, Seaboard Airline Station at Sebring. ACL had their own. Uh, this, the railroad doesn't quite get there, does it? Almost, we're gonna be begging on Saturday, but uh, this is the, <laughs> the, the uh, South Central Florida Express stops just short of that, but that's what most people think of when they see uh, uh, Sebring. Just south of Sebring are a couple of interchange tracks between them and CSX, and we are fearful of CSX on Saturday, but we'll see what can happen. There's also a customer or two in there, but this is what most people think of really is the north end of the railroad, Lake Placid. I put that in there because my wife is a, loves gardening and all. So if you're looking for bulbs, I'll we'll probably have them up there while we're there. Uh, oh, that's a little dark, but that is the ACL station. They're in uh, Lake Placid. It is now a museum. That's where we'll be unloading on Saturday. That's the sunny side. Uh, it is a rather small building. There is a nice little museum. And for those of you looking for food, like my wife, it is two blocks away at the farmer's market. Uh, they have, you can just barely see it, they have built a track there just recently so that the uh, trains, the passenger trains can stop at uh, Lake Placid. Uh, this is Child's. This is a brand new sugar loading facility. Uh, there's a little story behind it. Basically, sugar, U.S. Sugar discovered they owned a lot more land up there than they realized. Uh, they also had more customers up there than they realized, so they built a new cane loader at Child's, and it is a gorgeous one of the most modern things you'll ever see. This is them switching uh, the facility. I put this here because most, I guess almost all of it is trucked in a mile or two away. Uh, so I'm gonna show you, uh, that's what a cane truck looks like. Looks very much like a cane car. Those are the cane cars. Remember, most of them are built from old box cars from other railroads. You'll see them labeled CSX and all sorts of pretty paint, but uh, the key is it's got USSC on it. And again, they also are all designed to be unloaded only from one direction. If you want to really see that, Mike Rowe with his new show, what a, uh, what, Not Dirty Jobs is a brand new one, How America Works. It, they spent an hour, they have an hour show about U.S. sugar. And so uh, you can go see that. And here comes the trucks up on the ramp, getting ready to unload. They, cup, they hook them up and they rotate them right over and dump them into the pit, goes up the elevator. Uh, into uh, the cane cars. And so when Childs is working, they are lined up like crazy and I am not trespassing. I'm on a neat little hill right there next to them. And that's the conveyor that hauls the cane up into the cars. Uh, it happens to be right there where the Palm Down Sebring blocks uh, split, Mile 898. They do run a block system, and so you'll see these blocks. Some of them are really long, some are really short. Depends upon how much traffic there is. Up in that area is the Georgia Pacific. <laughs> it's the Georgia Pacific lead. They do have customers up there, uh, including Howard uh, Fertilizer. Uh, this is uh, one of the plants. Uh, you see several fertilizer cars there in the plant. Uh, so if you're chasing the Sebring turn, they will generally stop on the way south to work this facility. Uh, there's, this is an interesting story. Archbold was doing research on plants and environments in uh, kind of the Southwest Pacific until the Japanese showed up during World War II and he fled and came to Florida and discovered it was about the same that he was researching over there. And they developed this uh, biological research station uh, south of Lake Placid, and the railroad goes right through the middle of it, which means it's a little hard to get to some of the track in that area. Um, not everything goes well. I told you I was going to have a sad picture. 
my wife and I were chasing the uh, Cane 5 one day and it just didn't show up, didn't show up. So we went down and everybody told us broke. That was the only word some other people knew. Uh, and this is what we found. The good news was a little bit later, this is what we found, same train. They did get it to work. Uh, they do respond really quick. And uh, this is all the cane coming out of Childs, generally about 40, 50 cars at a time. They, uh, when they're running Childs, they run cane two and cane five or what was cane two and five. They run two trains a day up there to bring all that cane back. Uh, this is, those of you who remember the old, old Atlantic coastline, they love the lookout for car sign. That is still there, at what's called H&H &H Dairy. Most of the railroad welded rail, 40 mile an hour. Uh, you won't find this picture today. They have really cut the vegetation back in the last year or two. This is just north of Palmdale. This is Palmdale. That's today's depot, <laughs> the old scale house. Uh, now the reason there's two tracks there, Palmdale was where the line to uh, Everglade uh, City down on the port straight south of there split from the line that came to Clewiston. Uh, the switch was there at the old depot and they had two, two branches that were basically parallel to each other for a couple of miles. Uh, so on Saturday, those of you riding the train, if you notice the bridges over Fish Eating Creek, you can still see where it was two tracks. This is one of my favorite photo, photo locations out there. This is Fish Eating Creek. And Sarah, how many big trucks attempt to run us over when we do this? We're standing on the highway bridge. Um, fortunately, we got about three feet of room. The bridge next to it has zero feet of room. But uh, this is Fish Eating Creek, a gorgeous shot off of US 27. They again serve a number of companies up there, Graham Farms and others in that area. Uh, a lot of the uh, dairy business, by the way, that was around West Palm Beach has moved over in this area. Moorhaven is, was the original destination for the Atlantic coastline. Uh, it's a place that we will certainly stop Wednesday. Uh, the, uh, one of the things you'll see, almost guarantee these fertilizer cars are generally stored there. Uh, because of all the fertilizer companies, it's a good place to store cars uh, there. This is just north of the bridge. I always start this as the bridge. Yes, they have a turn span. And those rails actually lift up so the bridge can turn. When they come back in, they'll be up and then they slowly come down. It's a fascinating uh, operation to watch. Unless you're in a hurry. That's what the bridge looks like turned. And by the way, they have just bitched just devegetated this. Uh, the uh, canal and all has cut the brush, so we'll be able to get some good shots. Uh, but that is what the turn span looks like. I've also just painted that. That's, that's the turn span control. There's one on each side. Uh, crews do it oftentimes, but, it, but uh, like, like today, they had a bridge tender up there who turned it for the train. They painted these orange. Was there a reason they went to orange? He's laughing. I'm going to get this story later on. This is what most people think of the bridge. You cannot get this if you're on the train. This is across the big canal uh, from a lovely park. Uh, this is what you can get right there. Uh, nice big grassy area. And if you're brave, you can walk up US 27. And this is the big highway overpass that's up there. Just stand at the Moorhaven sign. That's the center of the bridge. And that's where you get this shot. Uh, that is Lake Okeechobee in the back. What most people don't realize is much of it is islands. And there's your lock over to the left and the dam to the right. In Moorhaven, Clewiston block, uh, this really separates uh, a lot of the activity, everything between here and Clewiston. It is just sugarcane uh, elevator after sugarcane elevator, just like this. This is Benbow. Uh, this is actually not owned by U.S. Sugar. This is a private operation. Uh, Florida Growers Associates was using it today. What's interesting is that is a U.S. sugar elevator, right? Basically across the tracks from each other. And the reason they have separate elevators is they pay the growers by the sugar content and they wanna be sure they know which cars are coming from which fields. So it's part of their tracking process. Another one of my little favorite shots, this is right up there by 720. It's the lone palm tree. I was up there again today. 
crews waving and local farmers coming in going, I'm, I'm tired of planting cane already. This is a common site. You'll see the uh, cane cutting. They use a machine that cuts it. Most of them today are green because they're now John Deere for the most part. And one of the things is if you're interested in birds, they're there. These machines really stir the, the bugs and snakes and everything up and every bird will be in there. And they love to ride the machines and have no fear of anything that I know of. Uh, this is one of the new cane cutters. By the way, one of my graduates was involved with designing that. So I got to see a lot of it. This is uh, downtown, just a few blocks from here. This is Sugar's corporate headquarters. Beautiful building. I think they should be congratulated for using a building that actually fits in town as opposed to people with their weird things. Uh, this is at North Shop. This is where the South Central Florida Express bases most of their operations at. This is where, uh, if you ride the, ride the uh, Sugar Express, this is where we board. Uh, you'll see trains here all day long. It's uh, very active out there. Everything from the Jeeps to the SWs type. This is North Shop. This was a heavy use shop, but it has become about half steam shop and half diesel shop now. Please, as I sent the notice out, don't go in them. They're busy. They were changing out prime movers yesterday and uh, a lot of, lot of work goes on in there. That is North Shop to the left. You will also see a lot of diesel locomotives. They bring them in, they get serviced, they get fueled, sanded, and crews change. And that, by the way, I'm sitting in a public street. So that's how you get that shot. This is uh, the 140, uh, 148 that we will be riding. Uh, this is in the area that we will be boarding, that they board all the uh, tracks. They're going to be doing some shop extensions, some track improvements and enlarging because their goal is to get more cars. I sent you the notice about where to buy three more passenger cars. Did you get that? Always looking for passenger cars. It's hard to find good passenger cars these days. Uh, this is what it looks like leaving. And that's from public property. I did not trespass really for any of this. Even, the, even in the loaders, I was out inspecting tracks. Uh, this was the train y'all had a year ago. Those of you riding with us tomorrow or the next few days, it's much bigger. This is uh, out by the school leaving town. Most of the trains wind up in this yard. This is the main yard there in the mill. Uh, notice all the lights, everything's lit up. They can uh, do a lot of nice work in this facility. This was actually before sunrise one morning. That's how dedicated I am to ride a train. <laughs> this is out at Evercane Road. Uh, that is the first major north-south road east of town. Every track going east towards Palm Beach, West Palm Beach goes across there. I got to be careful with directions because from Lake Harbor, every track that leaves Lake Harbor is going north. That's just historically the way the railroads did it. And so I use east-west so I don't get into that north-south game. Again, lots of canals, lots of pretty places out there to look at. This is uh, at the Miami Canal area. There at Lake Harbor. This by the way, on the very west end of this bridge is where Florida East Coast and Atlantic Coastline exchange property. This is Sebring, or the uh, Fort Pierce turn coming back. The only, if you see cars like this, you know it's a turn or the local. Uh, the, while the Atlantic Coastline Y is gone, the Florida East Coast Y is still there. And you'll see a lot of these funky little bridges. Uh, this one is in downtown Belle Glade, but with canals every few miles. And it's all because of the Lake Okeechobee system. It's a fascinating system of trying to balance all the water levels, all the waterways in the area. And many of these canals were navigable. Uh, they ran steamboats up and down them. There were locks on them. Also in Belle Glade, if you hunt, you can find the old Florida East Coast office. Still beautifully marked. That's probably about the best part of the building that remains today. There's also another sugar mill up there that is not part of U.S. Sugar, but they serve it. They have their own switching internally, and then all cars in and out are handled by uh, South Central Florida Express. 
believe the no trespassing like all facilities around here. But if you're sneaky, oops, if you're sneaky, that's at the front gate. They move a lot of molasses out of that facility. Uh, this is Runyon, another easy facility to see. There's Runyon uh, Village up there that's a housing uh, for, used to be housing for employees. It's kind of anybody that wants to buy a house up there now. These are uh, rock cars that the railroad acquired a few years ago when they're doing track work as part of bringing all the track up to 40 mile an hour. And that is the Runyon Kane facility, one of the older ones, but I'm sitting on a highway right there. You can see how close the highway is to it with the guardrail. See a lot of packing plants like this, old freezer packing plants, because they grow a lot of vegetables down in this area. It's not just oranges and sugarcane. This is at Lake Point. Uh, this is into Bryant. There's a line off of it, and it's a very sharp curve across a lot of U.S. highways. And it, for years, it was very entertaining. This was part of the reason that the uh, uh, cane, co the cane trains, the Bryant turns, are now going over Sugar's new line so they don't have to shove 30 and 40 car trains around this very sharp curve that they can't see around. They generally have a truck out there with a person on the ground trying to assist them around this. Just north of that canal point to Fort Pierce. Fort Pierce is a long block because the only trains that go up there is the Fort Pierce turn. And it's through a lot of uh, backwoods, but it does go by the US, polo fields. By polo, I mean riding the horse, hitting the little ball around. They also still have the Florida East Coast concrete mark, milepost markers. You'll see a lot of those. Uh, the West Palm Beach Canal is another one of these uh, streams that used to have steamboats on it. This is the bridge today, but notice the little uh, notches on top. This used to be a lift bridge. And all they did was remove the lifting mechanism and left the bridge in place. It used to look like that. That's the St. Lucie Canal up at Port Mackay. Uh, that will be a photo spot, we hope, on Sunday. There's your drawbridge sign again on public property. This is why Florida East Coast kept the 15.5 miles on the north end. Tropicana and a couple of other big businesses up there produce a lot of traffic, and so they switch it with their own facility on the crews out of Fort Pierce, but just to prove, sugar does get into that yard. Okay, Oklahoma line. It breaks off at Keela, just outside of town. It's now called the Cane Block, is the short way. It's the block system. It's 40 miles an hour, and this is milepost zero. They renumbered the mileposts, uh, so there's not duplicate. That was one of the big things. They have, re they have removed all duplication of mileposts on this railroad. This is Keela, the main line goes left, the branch goes straight. Yeah, there's signals. That's because there's a diamond out there between uh, the uh, branch and the sugar main. So they've got these signals that let them, let the crews know if it's safe to approach. I just thought that was funny. Now, he is resting there, his head is on the rail. Uh, this is a warning for those of you doing photo shots tomorrow. Uh, they're out there. Uh, this is the diamond. We were hoping to do a photo here, but they are having some signal problems after all the weather. And so we're going to do a, another shot that's probably a better shot, but maybe not as unique. Uh, this is probably where we'll do some shooting. This is up at Rogers Road, uh, another one of the big canals. And when you get off the train, do watch for my friend. He is always there. That's a much bigger one. This shot was from last year there at that uh, there at Rogers Road. So we hope to be able to get some good shots there. When you get all the way down to the Oklahoma uh, Mill, you exit the block and you're into yard limits. You can tell where yard limits begin, but they have done a lot of work and I am told we may be fortunate to get to ride some stuff tomorrow. They have been doing a lot of work and brush cutting. We'll get there and we will determine if we can get some additional, additional riding that has not been talked about. That is the Oklahoma uh, Mill. So uh, that is comparator. They mainly ship out uh, 
uh, tank cars, uh, sugar, molasses, things like that. The line used to go all the way out to Duda. Duda's uh, families from Slovakia. They moved in here, began growing onions and a number of other crops. They are now one of the big nationwide farm companies. They are all over the country. Uh, cattle, sugar cane, all sorts of vegetables. Uh, they do have a new facility on the new Cluiston main line. Now, if you're coming in from the mill, this is mile post zero on the Cluiston main. There's their depot. See, it does say depot. Don't have to make that up. Uh, this is today the mill from a view from that line. So you can see it looks very different than the earlier photos of the mill. Inside in that yard, there's normally two to three switch engines at any one time because they've got to spot the cane for unloading. They've got to load the cars. They have to load the sugar, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, that is very difficult to get unless you're on one of the tours that are occasionally done through the operation here. So check with the chamber. They do some nice tours of the mill. Leaving town, this is out at Evercane Road. Again, there's multiple road cross, multiple railroad crossings out there. Again, sugar cane's coming in off the Cluiston, Maine. This is what everybody wants to see, right? Everybody wants to see the flames. Uh, right now, there's a lot of flame out there because they are doing control burns in the Everglades. Uh, a lot, that's most of the smoke you've been seeing lately is uh, controlled burns in the Everglades. The reason this is done is it burns a lot of the chaff, a lot of the leaves off, and th they discovered that the Everglades used to burn all the time. And that's how the material decomposes. If it doesn't burn, it just gets down in the water and lays there and chokes the ground. Uh, so, it, so you do this, it helps uh, the waste decompose and also it makes it easier and cleaner on the sugar cane. I try now and then. Uh, this is the Vaughn loader. It's right there at Rogers Road. And if you look, it looks like there's cane there. There's not a stick of cane out there right now. It has all been cut. They are way ahead of schedule this year. This is, again, at Rogers Road. Good spot. Normally great sun in the morning, great sun in the afternoon. This is the Miami Canal. Notice the bridge in the middle is steel concrete on the end. That's because that used to be navigable and they put that uh, steel span in there when they stopped using the stream, stopped using the Miami Canal. By the way, it starts at Lake Okeechobee and finishes, you might want to guess, Miami, yeah. When they extended the line, one of their big challenges, US 27. They've got this major grade crossing across uh, it is big, it is a divided highway, it is big, busy, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the state did a good job of assisting with getting this done. Also, you don't see these little funky steel bridges anymore. All the new bridges, very modern concrete trestle uh, ballast deck bridges. This is right next to US 27. This is a little further up. This is near Prewitt. Prewitt was the north end up around Bryant. Weatherall was, or weather was the uh, original line out of the mill. And when they combined the line, they extended them so that you've got this block limit. But what, one thing that did do though, they had to change the mileposts. So you get to choose, I guess. Uh, the old sign, milepost 7.9, it is now milepost 33. This is at State Road 80. That's at Muck City. Road, I'll now mile pole 39. Uh, Muck City is also known as Prewit. There was a village there, workers camp, workers village there. That's the old commissary right next to the track. Uh, it's hard to tell, but underneath that paint, it still says US Sugar Commissary. I put this in here, there's another competitor. They're really the only sugar mill in the area without rail service, but this line, completely encircles them. One reason to go look at them is they did put this nice roller machine out display in their parking lot. So you want to see what a roller looks like. The flaghole line is the invisible line. There's really only one place you can see it, and that's at Flaghole Road. Uh, you may be able to catch it occasionally over near the citrus plant, but uh, that's why I like that picture. It just kind of goes out into the fog. 
Uh, much of this is brand new track from 2013. It's got a number of loaders in close to the mill, and then one loader out on the far end that is a private loader, and then it also serves the citrus industry out there. Also goes through the Girl Scout town. I've yet to get permission to go in. <laughs> and this is the end of the end of the flag hole out Southern Garden Citrus, which is owned by U.S. Sugar. Uh, orange juice processing. Uh, interesting, re there's the plant. Interesting reason, look at those tank cars. All those citrus oils that are used in soap and detergents and th cleaners and things. Railroad was hauling that stuff in and out. So that's a quick tour of the railroad. That is a quick explanation of the history. Obviously, I could not cover everything, but I hope I hit enough of the basics. Again, if you're interested, the book is the key. Uh, if you're interested, I know they'll sell. I'll be happy, happy to uh, autograph them out here. Scott has also brought, I assume those are free handouts down here, photos of the 148. So if you're interested, say thanks to Scott uh, about all that. Got questions, I'll happily handle them here or elsewhere, but I do want to thank you all for uh, Letting us do this. Apologize for technology, but freaking Microsoft took over. <laughs> and it was both computers at the same time. Yes. I have a question. Um, it's, a, that's kind of, it's my fault. Um, I forgot my who had sent me a copy of uh, my car. Well, you have some. They'll have, they'll have more forms tomorrow. They'll have more forms tomorrow. Uh, no. So I, I, I'm going to have to go. I'm going to have to reverse everything. It's in the book. It's in the book. We're, we're going to Sebring. We're going to Fort Pierce. We're going to Oklahoma. Okay. Yes. Martin, I got a few questions uh, from the wholesaler. Okay. Hello, Zoom. Sorry again about that, people. Okay. So, uh, Gas. The steam locomotive burns fuel, burns oil fuel. It'll smell a little bit occasionally like French fries and a few other things. Uh, it is biodiesel and other fuels that they're using, correct? Yeah, mostly vegetable oil. Mostly vegetable oil. The Vagas is used in the power plant here at the plant, which actually won, if you read the book, a uh, several national awards for environmental awareness with the uh, uh, clean way they burn it and produce steam and power, both electric and steam for the plant. So, so no, so you will see piles of it over there, but remember they're uh, processing sugarcane only part of the year. So they build it up and you and are able to use it all year. Uh, oh jeez. Okay. Okay. Let me let me hit it first. There's about 300 miles of track, about evenly split between the two operations. Okay, about 150 and 150. Uh, there's a couple of sidings on the South Central Florida Express. There are no sidings on the sugarcane lines. What there are are side tracks for the elevators. And not all elevators have one. Reed out here doesn't have an have a siding because they just shove straight down and pull back. I will tell you, if you see an elevator and there are cars on both sides, those on the mill side are loaded. That's how they do it. The empties are away from the mill. The ones towards the mill are loaded. Makes it really easy. Nobody gets confused. But most of the sidings will hold what? A about 35 to 40 cane cars on either side at the at the elevators. 
it varies from place to place, but that's about an estimate. much higher than other things. You gotta understand that uh, this area is grid of canals. And so if you're not in a canal, you're on higher ground. But there are levees and the railroad does tend to stick up a few feet above everything else. Would you say that's yeah, appropriate? You get a better view from the tracks than the fields. Yes. Correct. Yeah, it was, it was owned by a steel company. Yeah. Lukens? Yeah. And for those people who are not here in the room, you probably could buy a book right here. Tell people where they can get Where can you get the book? Um, Ron's Books, Amazon, and basically any bookstore. If you do a search, it's walmart.com, it's Barnes and Noble, et cetera, et cetera, because we go through Ingram. Uh, publishing. Uh, this is done in an interesting way. There's a print on demand. I don't have a thousand of these printed. You order a book through walmart.com, Ingram will literally print a book, get it to Walmart who gets it to you. Means I save a tremendous amount of money on, on paying ahead. The, neg the negative is it costs a little bit more to print and the quality is not quite as, as good. As far as pictures, we have to use black and white. We can't use color yet because the price is outrageous. But it is a way of doing small volume books. So if we sell 2,000 books, I haven't had to buy 2,000 books in advance. Yeah. Well, can, we can, Sarah. Yeah, yeah. We've had several that we've sent out. And then you didn't know it, but you got the rare first edition that's got the two typos that were fixed in the second book that was sold. <laughs> Can you autograph those for me? I will autograph anything. Yes. Let's discuss a little bit the unloading requirement. They didn't just drop all the materials in there and have options. Are they rotary dumped? No, no, no. They're not rotary. Well, they're kind of rotary dumped. They, they come up on a ramp and they're tilted a little bit. And then they use a chain. It, Mike Rowe show really shows it, but they kind of chain it. And then the door opens and it's tilted enough that the cane will fall out. And they do it section by section of the car. It, it comes out of the side of the car. It's basically the same process. And it, it, they move one car at a time, unload one car at a time, unload. And they've got several places there continuously unloading. Because the cane, they don't want to take more than 24 hours from the moment it's burned, which stops its growth till the time it's sugar. And I saw several cases today, I knew the crew was in a hurry. They were desperately trying to get some cane moved in with the heat today, as hot as it was, they didn't want any cane sitting around. The heat, once you start, once you cut it and all, the sugar's at its peak and it will start to weaken a little bit when you have a lot of heat like this, it kind of impacts it even faster. By the way, it is not normally 88 degrees here in January. Mid-70s is the more common. So even the locals were a little warm. It was 88 at one time today, according to where I was. But I was out in the cane field, probably a little, a little warmer. Others, I can do this all night. I don't want to. Yes. Yes. 